Well, thank you very much, Malcolm, and thank you so much for the Centre for bringing me here. I'm very happy to be here to talk to you today about some of the work that I did during my PhD. And as Malcolm mentioned, I'm now with DBCA um, as part of the Marine Science Program, and I work on managing or helping to do science to inform management of all of our reefs in Western Australia. So I want to say thank you um, to everyone who presented today because I can take all of this state-of-the-art leading edge um, research back home and um, talk to all the, the managers in Western Australia about what we're going to do about our coral reefs um, on the West Coast. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, the mechanisms of coral growth, um, particularly at high latitude. So how fast do corals really grow? Well, you might be surprised to hear that um, they can grow anywhere from a few millimetres a year to up to 15 centimetres for some of the fastest extending corals. This may not sound like a lot, or it might sound like a lot to you um, compared to sclerosponges, but um, it, if you think about many, many branches all growing together um, to form the reef structure, this is actually quite incredible. So how do they do this? This process of biomineralization has really fascinated scientists for several decades. Corals themselves are particularly amazing in the way that they rapidly form their calcium carbonate skeletons. As Malcolm mentioned, they have um, this incredible process of pH upregulation. Um, now how this works is they pump out hydrogen ions in exchange for much needed calcium using enzymes. And so it's thought to be a relatively active process. And uh, what this means for the coral is that this high pH actually shifts the composition of dissolved, dissolved inorganic carbon in favour of carbonate relative to bicarbonate. And the reason why this is important is because carbonate is really, you know, one of the key building blocks for the skeleton, along with calcium. At the same time, this high pH shifts the aragonite saturation state um, to higher levels, really facilitating the rapid formation of their skeleton. So it's gen generally thought that the calcifying fluid is uh, sourced from seawater, but as we know, it's not the same as seawater. And if it was, corals wouldn't be able to grow that 15 centimetres a year. Across the board, coral growth rates would be much, much less. So the coral calcifying fluid is tiny. It's microscopic in size and it's isolated beneath the living coral polyp, which makes accessing the coral calcifying fluid quite challenging. Um, there's been studies done using microprobes and pH sensitive dyes, and these have been incredibly informative to provide measurements of the composition of the calcifying fluid. But these generally need to be done uh, under laboratory conditions and can only be conducted for a few days at a time, um, typically. So we have this relatively limited knowledge of the calcifying fluid composition for corals growing uh, naturally in the field across different environments uh, and over a longer time scale, so for example, multiple years. And so the key here is that uh, some new geochemical proxies can really help answer some of these questions. But why are we interested in high latitude coral? So these are the corals growing um, at latitudes above 28 degrees north and below 28 degrees south. They're relatively cooler environments with low light levels compared to the tropics. And so they generally don't form those spectacular diverse reef systems that we see in, in the tropics. Um, so why are we interested in them? Well, they provide these really amazing natural laboratories to study the mechanisms and the limits of coral calcification under these lower temperature and light regimes. They're also predicted to be among the first and the worst um, environments uh, affected by ocean acidification. And we know that they're not immune to bleaching events, um, as has been seen in places like Lord Howe Island. So we set out to find some of the southernmost growing corals in Western Australia, and we found them growing in this amazing place called Bremer Bay. It's quite a temperate environment with lots of seagrass, but it happens to have seven species of coral growing there. 
So we set up two uh, sites to study how and why these corals are growing in this location. Now, our study species was this beautiful plating turbinaria, and it's thought to be quite a hardy, resilient species. It forms these large, extensive stands in Bremer Bay, so in some cases it could be uh, considered a functional reef um, for lots of the fish that live there. And if you're wondering how Turbinaria managed to make its way all the way um, to Bremer Bay in the south, um, this species actually has distributions in the tropics and the subtropics uh, around the world and uh, consistently along the WA coastline. And we have a warm poleward flowing current called the Lewin Current that researchers think is really instrumental in allowing lots of tropical larvae to make their way polewards, um, which is probably similar to the warm current that is also on the east coast. So we set out these fairly uh, extensive field studies. As Malcolm mentioned, I was in the field for most of my PhD um, because we wanted to look at seasonal changes in calcification for a long um, time period, so um, two year uh, study uh, periods. And so what we would do, it was, we would take corals and glue them to tiles and track them, their growth over time using the buoyant weight technique. And we would attach them to these aluminium tripod frames that are weighted to the seafloor. And this allowed us to uh, leave the corals to grow in situ and revisit them every three months. Um, what we also did was we tagged naturally growing colonies to look at uh, plate linear extension rates, um, as well as to go back and resample the same uh, corals every three months to look at the geochemical composition of the most recently formed part of the skeleton. Now, we also deployed temperature, light, and pH loggers to um, quantify those environmental conditions. Um, we wanted to look at uh, photophysiology as um, an indicator of stress or um, coral health over time, but this requires um, an hour of dark acclimation and is typically conducted at night, night time. Um, but we weren't allowed to go diving at night in Broma Bay, and so what we would do is take the corals from their support frames and bring them back to these makeshift aquaria labs wherever we were staying and conduct the dark acclimation there and do our pan measurements. So as um, Malcolm mentioned before, we use a lot of different geochemical proxies and I don't have time to go through each of the proxies that I used in this study, but if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But I'll briefly run through the three key approaches that we use. So all of the measurements that we did were performed on the most rapid growing edge of the coral. So we could sample these parts of the coral and be fairly certain that this was the most recent growth. Um, the first approach that we used was the well-established um, boron isotope proxy for calcifying fluid pH. We also used a relatively new approach that combines the boron calcium ratio in the skeleton with boron isotopes to quantify the carbonate ion concentration in the calcifying fluid. And as I mentioned earlier, that carbonate concentration is really important for growth. Um, and that was developed by Malcolm and others. And thirdly, we used this exciting new approach developed by Tom DiCarlo and others as well to quantify the aragonite saturation state of the calcifying fluid. And so together we could really look at almost the full range of the chemical composition of the calcifying fluid for corals growing in the field. So we found really interesting and unexpected results. Um, so those plots show temperature, light, and calcification rates. Um, you can see those nice seasonal curves with the blue panels showing winter and the white panels showing the summer. Um, and so what we would have expected was that growth rates would be much lower during the summer due to lower temperature and light levels, and that they would increase, um, yeah, they'd be much higher in the summer, sorry, and that they would be um, lower in the winter. And so we found the complete opposite pattern. So growth rates were highest during the winter, um, despite water temperatures of just 16 and 17 degrees. And if you look at these um, plotted um, against temperature and light on those upper panels, you can see that there's no real clear trend between temperature and calcification. And there's a negative trend between 
calcification and photosynthetically active radiation, so light. And there's a lag between peak temperature and peak light in Bremer Bay, and so that's why those relationships are actually a little bit different um, with growth temperature and light. And so these really unexpected responses actually provided a unique opportunity to look at what other factors could be influencing coral growth in this really unique environment. I should also, also mention that uh, the turbinary growth rates were quite robust. They were comparable to other spe species such as this pink uh, Pocillopera demicornis growing um, at sites in the tropics and the subtropics in WA um, where we measured growth rates in the same way. So our first real hypothesis was maybe it was um, thermal stress driving lower growth rates during summer because we know that these high latitude sites, despite their cooler temperature regimes, can still experience um, thermal stress. But we didn't see this in our um, photochemical efficiency data, so there was no signs of um, thermal stress and no signs of um, bleaching or paling. And basically what was happening was that the photochemical efficiency was following the light solstice. Um, and other studies have shown this for tropical corals, and they think it's a photo acclimatory response where you have higher levels um, in the solstice in June and lower levels during summer. I do want to point out, though, that we had this interesting result in the winter of 2016 um, where we had fairly low uh, photochemical efficiency values indicating possible sublethal stress. But this was actually due to unusually cold temperatures. So while most of the world was warmer than normal during 2016, the southwest of Western Australia was actually much cooler than normal, um, particularly during the winter. And many corals off the coast of Perth actually cold bleached. Um, so we didn't see any um, actual bleaching during the winter for these corals in Bremer Bay. But it was quite interesting that they were still able to maintain quite high growth rates despite this um, indication of sublethal stress. So as I mentioned before, or meant to mention before, these turban area corals are, um, have been shown to be quite heavily reliant on heterotrophy or food availability during times of sublethal stress or, or during suboptimal conditions. And so we wanted to look at chlorophyll A as a proxy for, or as an indicator of food availability and a potential proxy for increased heterotrophic feeding. And what we did find was that Chlorophyll A levels were higher during winter compared to summer, particularly during that first winter. And so it's definitely possible that this increased food availability was providing a way for the corals to maintain this um, quite high wintertime growth. But what was really interesting was when we started to look at um, the calcifying fluid chemical composition. And we were so fascinated by this because it was the first time we were able to combine all of these approaches um, to characterise almost the full um, range of calcifying fluid carbonate chemistry parameters for corals growing naturally in the field um, over such long time scales. And so the first result that was quite surprising was that the calcifying fluid um, calcium composition was actually um, below seawater. So seawater are the red crosses and then the internal composition is the, the blue circles and triangles. And what was also interesting was that they were able to maintain this relatively stable um, but elevated uh, internal saturation state. And many other studies around the same time um, found similar trends. And so they sort of concluded that this could be actually a prerequisite for uh, calcification to occur. We conducted very similar studies uh, on other parts of the West Australia coastline. So um, a tropical reef in, at Ningaloo and um, a subtropical island off the coast of Perth. And for many different species, we found this sort of broad scale response where um, as calcification rates increase, the calcium ion concentrations actually decline um, at these species specific levels. And so this might suggest that the calcium ion concentrations are not really a limiting factor for calcification. And this isn't entirely surprising given that 
the calcium ion concentrations are an order of magnitude, magnitude higher than carbonate ion concentrations, and so it's less likely that calcium would be the limiting factor. <coughs> and when we do look at the calcifying fluid pH and uh, the calcifying fluid carbonate ion concentrations, which I've put on the same slide because they're showing very similar seasonal trends. And these trends really m mirror those changes in calcification with higher levels during winter and lower during summer. And they're both elevated well above seawater. And so what this suggests is that there is actually a seasonal change in the regulation of both of these parameters. And the fact that it mirrors calcification um, indicates that it could actually be a potential mechanism that is driving changes in growth rather than um, other variables. And when we look at this relationship between the carbonate ion concentration and calcification rates, we find similar trends for many different species along the coast. And um, so it does appear that while temperature is probably in most cases a really key driver of growth rates, um, this isn't necessarily always the case. And for many of these corals, we, we didn't see that temperature was the key driver. In fact, it was aspects of the calcifying fluid composition um, that was describing most of those trends. So what does this mean? For, for Bremer Bay, it sort of indicates that these types of environments can support year-round coral growth despite very low winter temperatures of just 16 degrees. And these growth rates are comparable to other corals growing in more tropical environments. And we can sort of attribute these patterns to uh, increased food availability, but also this really important seasonal upregulation of the calcifying fluid chemistry. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much to everyone. And